Good morning and welcome back to The Box, which is Mills and Reeves webinar series for insurance brokers, intermediaries and their insurers. Uh, my name is James Thompson. I'm a principal associate in Mills and Reeves insurance dispute practice, uh, where I specialise in defending claims against insurance brokers and intermediaries. And I am delighted to be joined this morning by my colleague, Shay Williams. Good morning, Shay. Very good morning to you all. A couple of bits of housekeeping before we get going. Uh, firstly, this webinar is recorded and you'll receive a copy of the recording after the event and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel where you can catch up on all previous editions uh, of The Box. Secondly, if you have any questions whilst uh, Shay and I are talking uh, this morning, uh, then do type them into the Q&A function and we will uh, pick them up uh, at the end. So this morning's webinar is about the recent High Court decision in the case of George on High Limited and George on Rye Limited uh, versus Alan Boswell Insurance Brokers uh, Limited and New India Assurance Company. It's a case that starts as a broker's negligence case, but the most interesting aspect, we think, is the reminder of the law in relation to what an underwriter ought or will be deemed to know about its insureds as a consequence of matters that are known to its third party claims adjusters. And Shay will tell us what happened in the case. Thanks, James. Uh, as James has mentioned, I'm going to take you on a fairly whistle-stop tour of the recent decision of the High Court in George on High Limited versus Alan Boswell Brokers and others, um, whilst trying very hard not to succumb to the tongue twister caused by the claimant's names. Um, this is a claim against a broker, but what's interesting for today's purposes is that the broker joins the insurer to the proceedings, and James will be talking to you a little later about the tactical significance of this. This case concerned a 16th century boutique hotel in Rye, Sussex. The first claimant, George on Hire Limited, owned the freehold of the hotel, whilst the second claimant, George on Rye Limited, owned and operated the hotel business and the restaurant. And importantly, they paid their rent to George on Hire for use of the premises. The first defendant, Alan Boswell Insurance Brokers Limited, had a long-standing relationship with these claimants. Uh, since as far back as 2013, the broker had placed the claimant's property insurance, including BI cover, with the second defendant, New India Assurance Company Limited. Now, sadly, as you'll see from the screen there, the hotel suffered a catastrophic fire in July 2019, and during, during the period in which they were renovating, it wasn't able to trade. As a result, the claimant sought an indemnity from New India for losses caused by the fire. Uh, in the policy schedule, the insured was named as the George on High Limited, trading as the George in Rye. And the claim they made with the insurers comprised of George on Hire's losses for the damage to the building and George on Rye's losses caused by a loss of business whilst the hotel was unable to operate and loss of stock and contents. In response to the claim, New India accepted liability for the losses, losses suffered by George on Hire. However, they refused to indemnify George on Rye, i.e. the hotel business, for the business interruption and other losses. They argued that the hotel business and the restaurant was not insured under the policy because of the definition of the insured, which was the George on Hire Limited trading as the George in Rye. They said that it did not extend to cover George on Rye Limited. As a result, George on Rye pursued their brokers for their losses, alleging that the broker had negligently failed to organise insurance, which properly protected the entire hotel and its business. The broker's position was that New India should have paid out, and so they initially denied liability and joined New India as a second defendant. George on Hire and George on Rye also both claimed against the broker for other losses caused by inadequate insurance, including underinsurance of the value of the buildings. 
Now, those claims were settled prior to trial, so we don't know the specific details of the underinsurance issues. And whilst we aren't for today's purposes focused in on underinsurance, it does serve as another salutary reminder of the rising claims against brokers and insurers for underinsurance. Uh, this is very much the case for James and I and our colleagues dealing with broker claims, and we anticipate this will continue, um, particularly given the impact of inflation. Turning back to the George John Rye Hotel, trial went ahead dealing only with the issue as to whether it would be the broker or New India who should be liable for the losses claimed, totalling a not insignificant £2.27 million. In his judgment, Mr Justice Tinkler held that to ascertain the meaning of the policy, he needed to establish the meaning which the document, i.e. the policy schedule, would convey to a reasonable person having all the background knowledge which would reasonably have been available to the parties at the time they entered into the contract. So what did New India know or what, what ought they to have known about who the intended insured was? Evidence was presented to the court concerning personal injury claims made between 2014 and 2016 by employees and guests of the hotel. These claims were handled by Garwin, who were New India's third party agents. By reason of managing those claims, the evidence demonstrated that the TPA were aware of the fact that George on Riot ran the business of the hotel, which included employing the hotel staff. The TPA's knowledge of this was noted throughout the TPA's internal correspondence and even in an attendance note of a meeting between the TPA and the operator of the hotel. In each of those historical claims, neither the TPA nor New India questioned whether George on Rye was, ins was insured under the policy. And most importantly, each of those claims was settled by the insurers. It was also noted that it was George on Rye, the hotel business, who had paid the policy premium each year in, since insuring with New India. Despite all of this evidence, New India's position was that they had no knowledge of the George on Rye's involvement in the historic claims and that the knowledge of their third party claims handlers should not be imputed to the knowledge of New India's underwriters. So what does the statute say about what an insurer is deemed to know or ought to know? Mr Justice Tinkler drew upon the relevant parts of the Insurance Act 2015, which sets out the scope of the duty of fair presentation. Section 5 of the Act provides exceptions to those duties, dealing with matters that the insurer either already knows or ought to know, and thus need not be disclosed or brought to the attention of the insurer. The legislation tells us that the insurer knows something only if it is known to individuals who are either an employee of the insurer or their agent, so essentially, this extends to anybody who is practically involved in underwriting the risk. But importantly for today's purposes and for the George on Rye, subsection two provides that an insurer ought to know something only if an employee or agent of the insurer knows it and ought reasonably to have passed on that relevant information to any individual involved in underwriting the risk or the relevant information is held by the insurer and is readily available to anybody involved in underwriting the risk. Thus, information may be something insurer ought to know if it is information that's known to its agent. Knowledge is not, therefore, limited to knowledge of employees only. The judge was also referred to the leading insurance textbook, which states that section, section 5 subsection 2A is intended to include, for example, information held by the claims department or reports produced by surveyors or medical experts to assess the risk. Subsection 2B is intended to require the relevant underwriter to make a reasonable effort to search such information as is available to them within the insurer's organisation, such as in the, is in, in the insurer's electronic records. So based on all of the evidence presented, the judge held that it was clearly the common intention of the parties that George on Rye was an, an insured under the policy. As such, New India were ordered to pay damages in the region of 1.5 million plus costs. And what we can see on the screen here is the now lovely George on Rye Hotel fully renovated and uh, back open. So what does this decision mean for brokers, underwriters and insurers in practical terms? And I will pass the baton back to James, who is going to focus on some of the practical risk management considerations we can take from the judgment.
Thanks very much, Shay. Uh, that's a really helpful summary of what happened in the case. Um, as you all know, The Box is a webinar series of brokers and insurance intermediaries and their insurers. And I think this case is relevant to all of you. It's not new law, but it's a helpful summary of the existing law. And I imagine the extent of what an underwriter will be deemed to know as a consequence of the knowledge of or actions of a third party claims adjuster will be a surprise to many of you. It's a good defence for a broker and raises some significant risk management issues for insurers and their TPAs, but also MGAs and cover holders as well. So just summarising some of those key principles um, that uh, Shea has drawn out uh, from the facts. Um, New India was a legal entity, not an individual, and thus its knowledge would inevitably be an aggregation of matters uh, that were known to various individuals. What underwriters actually know is fact dependent. Underwriters should be held to know facts uh, that, were, that, were, that were within the actual knowledge of the in individuals who are underwriting uh, the policy. But there may be other employees who have knowledge such that New India in its legal capacity as underwriter would be treated under common law as having that same knowledge. And for the purposes of assessing whether an insured has made a fair presentation uh, under the Insurance Act, uh, the underwriters will be held under the Act to know things that they ought to know. And as Shea has said, uh, McGillivray, the leading textbook on insurance law, indicates that matters that are known to claims handlers, third party agents, um, are matters that ought to be known to underwriters. Now, in this case, New India's claims handlers, Garwin, were authorised and able to appreciate the significance of information provided to them, since their role was to assess the extent to which an underwriter was liable to pay out to an insured person under a policy. Generally, matters that an insurer's agent knew in the course of their duties uh, might be presumed to be known by underwriters. And finally, matters that can only be deduced by collating separate facts known by different people are fundamentally less likely to be found to be known to the underwriters uh, than facts that are clear without such collation. And that goes back to the fundamental tenet of this, um, that it is a highly fact dependent exercise. So let's look at some of the practical issues, starting with uh, brokers. As I say, this is a case about insurance brokers negligence and the insurer's actual or deemed knowledge is being used as a defence uh, to that claim. We're not focusing on the issue of uh, breach of duty uh, here in any great uh, detail. The error was pretty obvious on the part of the broker, it seems to me. If you intend two parties to be insured under a policy, then you should have them listed on the schedule. But in relying on a question of an insurer's actual or deemed knowledge, that they have justified the joining of the insurers uh, to the litigation in what would otherwise have been a straightforward fight between the broker and the policyholder. It's the best position for a broker to be in, to be able to build a case, to build a defence uh, that says the insurer should be paying this claim. Now, in this case, New India had been handling claims by third parties against George John Rye for a number of years. These claims, as Shea explained, had been handled by a third party agent. Claims had been handled, sorry, had been paid under the policy, Cover had never previously been declined on the basis that George on Rye was not an insured. The agent's claims handlers had also received funds from George on Rye, which had been recorded on the file as being from the insured. There was also evidence that the, that the uh, Garwin's claims handlers had been informed of the relationship between the two entities uh, in a meeting with the common uh, directors. New India argued that they had no knowledge of the involvement of George on Rye in relation to historic claims. And they said that knowledge uh, held by Garwin, uh, their third party claims handlers and other members of uh, New India's staff could not be imputed to underwriters. Now, you could see that practically it can re require something of a deep dive into the records uh, held by the claims team and underwriters in order to piece together uh, the evidence that a broker will need uh, to advance this sort of uh, defence. Thinking about the role of the third party agents, and this could be any sort of insurance intermediary, TPA, MGA, cover holder. There can be real practical challenges to ensure that information held by those entities is communicated to underwriters. You can imagine situations, to be honest, where underwriters aren't even aware who the TPA is 
uh, and yet things that they are doing and things that they know uh, can be held uh, to be known to the underwriters. So it's critically important that insurers understand, ensure that the delegated authority of a TPA is firmly pinned down so that adjusters know what is expected in terms of handling claims where there is an apparent ambiguity. Is the entity on the schedule the entity against whom the claim is made? Do you have authority to deal with it? Do you need to refer it as the TPA uh, to your capacity provider? And ensure that the file is adequately documented Conversations will need to be recorded in an attendance note because otherwise underwriters will have no way of practically uh, finding it. And again, these could be conversations, the content of which uh, is being uh, imputed to the knowledge uh, of underwriters. So it's a very difficult position uh, to be in uh, if there's no uh, record of it. Equally, insurers need a mechanism to capture the information uh, that is held by uh, third parties. And I won't today go into uh, questions of uh, whether or not an insurer has got a, a right of action, uh, if a breach of uh, delegated authority as a result of uh, potentially paying claims in respect of entities that aren't listed uh, on the schedule or not challenging uh, any ambiguities or picking up uh, coverage issues. But plainly, uh, there is a risk to a TPA uh, that finds itself in a position where its conduct is being uh, blamed for, as the reason uh, why uh, underwriters uh, now need to cover a particular entity and pay a particular claim. So your key takeaways, underwriters need to make full inquiry of their claims teams uh, when uh, writing uh, risks. Uh, including those operated by TPAs, to gather information that's relevant to the placing of a risk uh, and which they will otherwise be deemed to know in the event of a dispute. A failure to do this can lead to insurers being unaware of all insured entities uh, or other aspects of the risk in question. But these issues are equally relevant to underwriters and also to brokers uh, who are looking to, to challenge coverage decisions, uh, as was the case uh, here. So that's all we've got to say in relation to the case. I'm now very happy to deal with any questions that anyone might have. Paris, James, good morning. We have a couple of questions that have come in and I'll start with the first one, if I may. Of course. Uh, the question asks, as a broker, if I'm in this situation with a claim made against me, but I think that the issue is something that insurers knew, just how do I go about making that case? It's a great question and obviously goes to the, sort of the practical dimension of, you know, how is a broker going to um, you know, mount a defence of this uh, nature? Um, you know, as I said before, each case is highly fact dependent. So, you know, it's going to be a question of what you as the broker, um, you know, typically you'll be working with your you know, defence panel um, lawyers. You have a claim against you, it'll be an under, underlying uh, insurance claim that, that, that that's unpaid. And you'll be thinking about, um, you know, whatever the material fact is that's in dispute. Um, uh, and if you believe that there are issues that underwriters knew, well, you need to go hunting for the evidence. Um, now, that is likely to be evidence uh, perhaps on underwriter's file. So there's a question of disclosure of uh, that file. It may be evidence that is on the in the claims file, whether that's an in-house in insurer's claims file, whether that's the claims file of a um, of, of a TPA. But you need to go hunting for the um, for the paper paper trail. Um, and you know, in, in circumstances um, you know, where perhaps there is a gap on the insurer's um, paper trail, um, then you'd be looking to your own file because there may be information that you hold, um, which is going to be able to demonstrate uh, that you communicated a particular piece of information um, to, uh, to to uh, to underwriters. Um, but you know, it's that forensic job that you know we as litigators um, undertake when, when we're looking to um, to defend a, a, a case like this. But I say it's highly fact dependent, and you, you know you've got got to go looking for the evidence. So, so it's actually not straightforward, is it? Because in a way, one's talking about changing the whole way in which brokers and those alongside them operate, um, naturally not to necessarily dot every I and cross the T of a conversation, for example, where in month one, you don't have any sniff of any problem, but month 25, you do. And what if the insurers just say no? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, I think that you know, there are two sides to this, you know, if a broker maintains a good file and is and is documenting all the work that it's doing as the agent of the policyholder, well, first off, it's helping to insulate itself against criticism and, and claims by um, policyholders, but it may also be helping to make the evidential case that it can then make against um, against insurers. And you know, 
that's really all a broker can do. You know, ensure that you are communicating the material facts that uh, you know need to be communicated to insurers. You know, ensuring that the uh, policy documentation is right, and uh, you know where there are changes or where there are you know pieces of information that are being communicated. Make sure that's on your file so that actually even if there is a question mark around what, what's on uh, insurer's uh, file, uh, you're able to advance a positive case to say, I told you and here's the evidence. Yeah, yeah I can see that. Um, on, the, on the alternative side of things, what if my client sues me? What are the risks of joining insurers into the court proceedings? Sure, uh, that's another great question. Um, you know, I say here, obviously it was great tactics on behalf of the, the broker and, and their defence team to, to join uh, insurers. Um, because as I say, otherwise it, it would be a straight fight and where you've got you know, brokers claims a lot of the time, you know, questions of breach of duty are normally pretty binary. Um, and here you can see um, that the broker would have been exposed to, um, to, to, to an adverse finding on that. So you know, joining the insurer is the difference between having to pay the claim and uh, not. Your risk is really in relation to cost. You know, you're joining a party to litigation. Um, you know, ordinarily, you, you, you are responsible for your, your own costs. And if you can uh, defend the claim, then you hope to make some uh, recovery against the claimant. Um, you know, where you're joining a second defendant, uh, then you, know, you are dependent on your, uh, your claim against them and you know, those aspects of your defence. Um, coming coming good, because otherwise you, know, you are going to be on the hook for uh, your costs, claimants' costs, damages, and the costs of the insurer that you have uh, joined. But if you're right, if your case is uh, a good one, um, then plainly you can displace that uh, costs exposure um, and insurers, if they are ultimately liable to be um, paying, the, uh, paying the claim, uh, then they ought to be paying the, the costs. Um, one thing I will say on costs is, you know, even in a situation like this where insurers uh, have been held liable to pay a good chunk of the claim, the fact that a broker has caused this ambiguity uh, by not including you know, every intended insured entity on the schedule, uh, that has arguably caused the risk of the dispute with the, with the insurer. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we, we see it in, in other decisions like the uh, you know, the, the ABN AMRO and, and RSA uh, decision from a couple of, of years ago, where um, you know, brokers can be on the on the hook for the uh, for the costs of uh, of, of causing that uh, dispute. Um, but fundamentally, you know, costs costs are your risk, and it may well be that you know, joining insurers is your only chance to displace um, some of that risk and and uh, to try to pass over um, uh, that that exposure to to another party. So it worked here. It's not without uh, risk. The other thing to say, of course, is it's not always you know trial is you know very rarely the uh, the end game. You know, when you're in litigation, you you know you have to. Um, kind of anticipate and, and assume that's where you you might end up in front of a high court judge. But you know, an awful lot of cases of this type would end up in a mediation. So part of your strategy may well be to join insurers, you know, with a uh, you know a, a desire ultimately to to share the pain. Um, and that's not what they did in this case. But I can see lots of cases where that would be the sort of the, the tactical imperative um, and why you might uh, want to to have insurers involved. Yes, it's, it's, it's a sort of double-edged sword, isn't it? Because one might decide to <clears throat> pursue the case, on the other hand, at the same time as inviting others to mediate. And one might also say it's tough luck on insurers at the moment, more so than it is brokers. But I suspect it's it's almost an equal level, level playing field, depending on the facts of the case. Yeah. And once, and once you're in, you're in. You know, you, you, if, if, you, if you join a party to proceedings, you have got to accept the consequences of that, which are... Yeah. Costs follow the event in um, English litigation, and uh, you know you, you cannot bank on being able to, um, to to settle a claim necessarily. So you know mediation or some form of you know alternative dispute resolution might be your strategy, but that might not come to pass, and you might not you know the appetite might not be there on, on the part of the other parties. Um, so you yeah. know it is you know, like all questions in litigation, it, it, it can it can be relatively high stakes. Well, we could carry on talking about this all day, I have no doubt. And uh, that's evident from the number of questions that have come in, which I will leave you to deal with separately. But we're running out of time. And so um, I have to pass the baton back to you to close up, if I may. Of course. Thank you, Harriet. And thank you to everybody for uh, joining us. Um,
It's been uh, great, great to see you. As I say, a recording of this webinar will be landing in your inboxes uh, shortly. Uh, every edition of the uh, box is available on our YouTube channel. And if you've got any ideas for uh, future editions uh, of the box, uh, then we would love to uh, hear from you. Any issues that relate to uh, brokers, intermediaries um, and their professional indemnity uh, concerns, um, or if you would like to be uh, a guest on a future edition, uh, then please do uh, complete our feedback uh, form uh, and get in touch. Um, but for now, thank you very much for joining us. I'll leave you to the rest of your day. Uh, goodbye from us. Bye-bye.